Well, thank you for joining us in another video. Uh, I'm Dan Kirk here at Brooks and Kirk. Now, this video is for the purpose of revision for um, one, uh, our apprentices that are studying the digital marketing apprenticeship. So we thought we might uh, upload this if it's useful for others. Um, so if you're interested in me, uh, our company, or um, about Brooks and Kirk, or even the digital marketing apprenticeship, then uh, please do feel free to head over to brooksandkirk.co.uk where you can find uh, a bit more about it. If you find this useful, please do uh, like. If you've got a comment, yeah, fantastic. And uh, you're welcome to share it. Take care. Right, so um, coding principles is the topic for this session. But luckily, you don't have to actually do tons of coding or anything like that to hit the criteria for this qualification. But in the objectives for today's session is to understand the function of algorithms, um, to be able okay. to interpret logic from algorithms, and to be able to interpret algorithms using pseudocode notation. Have you got a pen and paper with you? I do indeed. Because I'll need, you will need um, to write down on like yeah. acronyms and such like, <laughs> so I remember them. Yes, absolutely. What what are you going to be doing? Well, you're going to have to be able to define logical expressions. There will be some activities to complete where you'll have to define uh, logical expressions and you've got to state the outputs of following uh, and using an algorithm in pseudocode. So you've got to be able to read the pseudocode, mm -hmm. interpret it and state what the outputs are going to be as a consequence. Okay. okay. Right, some key terms you need to be aware of. An algorithm... It is, you probably will be examined on this, so um, just okay. bear that in mind. But an algorithm is basically a set of rules to be followed to calculate something or to solve a problem or do something, achieve a function of some kind. Um, now, pseudocode is actually the bridge between an algorithm and before you actually go to program it. So it's a way that you can plan your program out in written language so that you can kind of get an idea of what is going, what variables are going to be and, and various other things. So it's kind of a bridge gap. It's not a specific programming language per se. It's, it's something that anybody should be able to understand and then interpret it and develop it in whatever programming language that they happen to use. I'm going to explain a little bit more about that later. Yeah. Boolean. Boolean operators um, are binary. They are literally either yes or no, on or off, true or false kind of thing. Okay? Okay. So, here's a first problem. So, a taxi company needs to calculate the cost of a fare. Mm -hmm. There's a £1.50 standing charge and it costs 80 pence per kilometre or 95 pence per minute, whichever is greatest. Okay, so that's right. a problem in the Queen's English, hopefully. <laughs> How much would the fare be for this? Talk me through the um, talk me through the maths that you're doing. Okay, so first off, eight kilometres. We know eight kilometres equals eight pence. So eight times eighty. Eight times. Hang on. So. But I could do 8 times 8 instead, that's also why I won't just add a 0 on it. Keep it simple, let's keep it simple. So you're going 8 times 80, which mm -hmm. gives you an answer of... Gives me an answer of... 600 and something or other... You can use a calculator, there's no points for working it out in your head. Seven hundred and... no. Oh. No, 640. So eight okay. times, what, what are you doing again? Eight times 80? Yep. Yep, spot on, 640. So then put... The what is that eight. in pa pounds of pence? That's, that's six pounds 40. Yep, good. Okay, so then kilometre is how many metres? Are you sure you finished with that? Have you can, have you actually actioned all parts of that instruction? No, I, I haven't. Not yet. 
If there's a oh, this case needs cost that spares one pound fifty standing charge. Uh, sorry, standing charge is just a general waiting fee, right? I can't answer your question. That's your instruction. Okay. What's the um, output? So then you would add one pound fifty to that, which gives us uh seven ninety. Yeah. Okay, cool. So that's that first bit done. Okay. What's uh, the next bit you'd calculate? Okay, let's just going to calculate the cost of uh, uh, eight kilometers or per minute. Uh, well, hold on. How fast is the taxi going? It took the journey six minutes. You're going into a bit too deep, so let's read the question again. So a taxi company costs late, needs to calculate the cost of a fare. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a £1.50 standing charge, and it costs 80 pence per kilometre or 65 pence per minute, whichever's greatest. So we oh, know okay. that it's... So it's six, six times uh, 95. Um, or 0.95, which I definitely can't for. So zero point nine five times six. Are you is, going for zero point? Fair enough. Is five pounds seventy. Yep, spot on. So five seventy. So Anything else? One fifty. Plus one fifty gives us what? Uh, gives us seven pound twenty. So the cheaper one. Uh, so in other words. Whichever is greater, so they would choose the seven pound ninety. So the customer would be charged seven pound ninety. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Spot on. So let's just change um, the question. How would you calculate this then? So we need to figure out. Let's see. Um... What a what a tenth of uh, eighty is. So that's eight. So then we can get the zero point one. That's the so we're just calculating journey B now. Yeah. Uh, so it took thirty-one point four kilometers and took twenty-seven minutes. Yeah. So we know for a fact. Oh, I could just do the maths. That's the idea. Yeah, let's do yeah, that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to think. Um, okay, so we know it's 0 0.14, so um, 8 times 4, that's 16, 32. 8 times 4? Yes. Why are you doing well, that? Uh, because a tenth of 0 0.80 uh, 80 pence is 8. One ten, yeah. and it's zero point four. So it's why zero point four? Where's that coming from? Because it's thirty one point four. Okay. Um. So then I've got that, which is thirty thirty two. So that'll be equal to zero point thirty two pounds. Um, and then let's see, thirty one times thirty one times. Are you using a calculator, Chris? Uh, yeah, I'm just, okay. I like to write them right down. Uh, 31 times 0 0.8. So you're going 31. So, so far, you've gone 31 times 0 0.8, yep. which gives you 24.8. Yeah. Then you add on the 0 0.32. 0 0.32. Yes. Why Staying. three two? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's zero point four. So eight times. I'm oh, sorry. Eight pence times four is like two. Correct. Eight pence. Yeah. So so. 
because what you would do is just 0 0.8 times by 0 0.4 to give you the, if you're doing it that way, or you'll just do 31.4 times 0 0.8. Oh. Okay. Uh, so if I, if I start, let's start again. So you, the the way that you interpreted this, you're going this number here times by that number there, yeah. Yeah. To find out the cost just for the oh, distance right so 31.4 times by 0 0.8 gives us what 25.12 okay 25 and that's eight okay that's definitely not we'll just leave that bit there shall we <laughs> okay sure you said 25 point what 12 i don't know what what was he doing right let's start over <laughs> 25.12 okay yeah. is that yeah. it that is it and then what you about? add on the one point uh, one pound or just 1.5 yeah which gives us which gives us 26 62. Good. Perfect. So that's the first leg. So now let's calculate the next leg. Right, okay, so it would be 0 0.95 times 26.37. Well, this is, get, this is where it gets really difficult. And I oh, am no, being no, no, mean. No, no, it doesn't work because, yeah, I see what you've done here. So it's 60, it's not 100, so it can't be done like that. No. Um, so what you've got to do is you've got to calculate how long, no, how much it costs per second. Because then you could just do 26 times 60 to give us a number of seconds in 26 minutes, plus the 37 seconds. So let me help you. So per second... So 0 0.95 per minute, agreed? 0 0.95 per minute, yep. So if it's per second, we do 0 0.95 divided yes. by 60, yeah? Divided by 60, yep. Oh my god, that's a massive number. Which is oh no. 0 0.1583. Three recurring. Three. Let's just pretend there's only one per second, agreed? <laughs> Yep, okay. How many seconds in um, 26 minutes? Uh, okay, so 26 minutes. Let's see. Uh, six times. 26 times what? Uh, I can't remember. It's on your screen. Oh, it's 60. Oh, sorry, I was looking at my calculator. Okay. 26 times 60 gives us 1,560 seconds. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's for the 26 there. And then we yep. just add 37 seconds. Which is equivalent to... On five nine seven. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and one five that's... nine seven times by. Oh, what was that number? Zero point one five eight three gives us. No, that can't be right. It would help if I typed a decimal point properly, wouldn't it? So one five nine seven times 0 0.1583 my maths are wrong somewhere chris help me out <laughs> okay uh well let's see we know that let's go back to these 26 times 
Zero point nine five. So that's easy enough. That's twenty. I know what's wrong. It's decimal point wrong here. That number there is wrong. Oh. So coming back to that calculation, so we know it's it's zero point nine five pence mm -hmm. per minute. So we do zero point nine five divided by yeah. sixty. Sixty gives us zero point, point zero. zero. That's why. Zero point zero one five eight three. Plus twenty-four point seven. So the answer should come to twenty-five point two eight five eight <laughs> three recurring. <laughs> we'll just go for twenty-five pounds and twenty-eight pence uh, plus twenty-nine plus the one. Well, it doesn't say that, does it? No, but if it's five, you have to round up. Well, does is that what it says in this uh, algorithm? No. To do that? So a plus £1.50 to that gives us £26.28, and pence, yeah? Okay. No, 70 yet. I didn't add the 50 on. £26.78. So which one would um, win? Which one? What's the fare? To the customer. Uh, to the customer would be. I've lost all my math now. Um, if we go for the biggest one, mm -hmm. it it would be the time. So I write everything down. This one here, yeah. Yeah, it'd be time. So it'd be twenty six yeah. pounds seventy eight. Ah, but would it though, Chris? Here's a spanner in the works for you, just because I'm a little mean. Let's read this carefully. A taxi company needs to... There is a £1.50 standing charge, and it costs 80 pence per kilometre. Well, how many kilometres have they travelled? 31. Per kilometre. Not fraction of a kilometre. So one could argue it could be 31. Okay? So you forget okay. that, potentially. And mm -hmm. it says, or... 95 pence per minute. Well, it's technically done only 26 minutes. Not 27. Okay. So, my, what, the point that I'm getting at is, if you write a problem down in plain mm. English, we've done that, it's not always foolproof. You know, it's still open to some sort of interpretation. It can be. If it's not written clearly enough, it can be open to interpretation. And, you know, if we were to always do this, if I was to give this to 100 people, would we always get 100 of the correct answers? You would like to think yes, but <laughs> probably not. <laughs> you know, some people may be really analytical and, and do it like the second example that I gave and just to do it by full minutes or full kilometres travelled, mm -hmm. which therefore would create, you know, a, a problem. Yeah. So um, that's where an algorithm can help come in because it can take that problem and it can break it down into a key set of sequences to solve it. A bit like a method if you're in the kitchen cooking a meal. Um, you follow that and by the end of it, you will get an end result if you followed it correctly. So it's really useful if you're solving problems um, or you need to code something in a, in a specific programming language later on. So algorithm constructs. Inside of an algorithm, there are three key things that you'll need to pay attention to. So the first construct is a sequence. And it is exactly that. It's just a natural flow of a program from step one to step two to step three to step four and you will execute every single step in order. Okay? okay? Selection, where it starts to get a bit more interesting because it can contain a question or it can have a different sequence depending on specific values or events. So an example of a selection statement could be an if statement. 
So you can have an if statement in there that you can put in there to try and deal with re real world situations. So if something is greater than something, then do this, else do that. That is selection because you're selecting a set of instructions based on a previous value. If that makes okay. sense. So if statements are an example of selection. And then the third construct you need to be aware of is something called iteration. So iteration is, it's like a loop or a sequence of events. And that sequence of events or loop can continue indefinitely, or it can stop when a certain criteria is met, or it could start if a criteria is met. Um, okay. So yeah, iteration is a great way to insert those um, instructions, those uh, loops uh, without having to code it out one step at a time. So this is definitely true. <laughs> I definitely want, I want a cup of tea. All right. Okay. And here is the sequence. That will always get the sort of cup of tea that I would want if you follow it correctly. Okay? Okay. So that's an example of sequence. You follow each step in order. There's no if statements, no ifs, no buts. It will do it, hopefully. Okay. So it'd be very exact, everything down to the exact uh, how many litres of milk, etc., etc. Yeah, let's assume that add milk, it's a predefined statement saying add 25 millilitres of milk. Or mm -hmm. whatever. This is just really simple, just to get an idea yeah. of what the sequence is. Okay. Well, the problem is with uh, that sequence is there's no decision making at all that can take place, and you know it could fail if a parameter or what it's expecting isn't there. So um, yes, it's fine. We've got. Uh, water in the kettle we've boiled the kettle yeah tea bag into cup we've managed to find a cup not a problem yeah put sugar in the cup we found the sugar there's enough sugar great pour the boiling water yes it's up to temperature yeah, it's fine not a problem uh, stir and wait yeah that's not a problem we've got a spoon it's nice and clean but we've got no milk left our program would stop or hang or task uh, not responding and on a website <laughs> That's pretty bad because then the web page will stop working or come up with some nice JavaScript errors or something like that. Um, do you know the, the type of error that this is that I've just given you an example of? Uh, no, you will I'm have heard of it. Oh, runtime error. Yeah, it's tried to run it, but it can't. It can't facilitate it. It's just a standard runtime error, really. So sequence, fine, but limited. So you can improve it by um, trying to mitigate some of these problems and plan ahead. And you could have some sort of decision-making process that works based on uh, variables or inputs that you, you are telling the, the program. Um, you can build those log logical decisions into the program to avoid those runtime errors to f so that it can actually continue. So. The sorts of stuff that you can include, there's something called uh, relational logic. So it could be mm -hmm. if if something, and this is where the, the, the start of the if statement would be, if milk, blah, then blah. So what you put in that syntax is the relational logic. So it could be, what's that symbol? I don't remember the name of it. I don't. I remember it's greater than, or or... less than. Equals, what's that one mean? Uh, no idea. Does not equal. Okay. Okay. What about that one then? Um, greater, greater than or equals? Yeah, greater than or equal to. Less, less than, than or, or equal, equal to. to. Okay. So you would put your um, relational logic into that um, selection statement, something like that. Okay, milk left equals zero then. So that's kind of building in some sort of checking process. Mm -hmm. So that 
the output of that is boolean it's either true or it's false it's either condition met or condition not met okay so okay. you've only got one way that if statement could go well two ways yes carry on or no do this instead okay yeah you can also build in boolean logic into your um if statements so you could use these logic items so I know they're kind of self-explanatory to a certain mm -hmm. extent, but this is what you could do in an if statement. Read it to me. Okay, sorry. Uh, if milk left, greater than zero, and if tea bags left, greater than zero, then... So what's that doing? That is saying if both of those are greater than zero, then do something. Yeah, Obviously, if we've got some milk like left, it. if we've got some tea left, then you're probably going to carry on the function. Okay. So here is an example of um, that same algorithm with a little bit more um, selection in there. Okay. It's not perfect by any stre stretched imagination. It's just a real basic example just to hopefully build that. Just note that sometimes you'll contract words to one. What this is saying, this is now something called a variable because it can have a different value. T bags left, it could be 14 or it could be one, it could be 900. So that, that's okay. telling you that's a variable. Okay. Okay. So what, what does this selection of... Um, algorithm do so in plain t -bags, english in t bags if they're greater than zero then you put it into the cut but if but if else so in other words the only thing that could be else is zero so if there's no t bags it will tell you broadcast no t so i presume it'll come up with something saying broadcast no t or it'll ask you one coffee mm -hmm. uh and if so you have to put an end if at the end of an if statement because computers can't understand when that else has ended. So if you didn't put an end if and you had a load of other instructions to say uh, pour water over kettle, over tea bag or whatever, it would think that it's part of the else statement. So we put the end if to say, right, that's it. We closed it off now. Finished with this if. Carry on with the sequence but is so, it like is it actually called like end if yeah okay yeah and depending on the programming language it does kind of differ how you would do that but normally it's just end if okay okay so iteration then so you know sometimes that sequence it does need to repeat be repeated um yep. You know, like, if I wanted three cups of tea, there's nothing wrong. Well, there is quite a lot wrong, but this would function. This this algorithm here would work. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, it's been repeated four time, uh, three times. Three, three. It would function. Problem is, this amount of code loading on a web page would take a long time in... Well... Not really, but it but, would take longer than it would have to. Okay. That's one reason why you wouldn't program it like that. So there's something that says, rather than repeat all that code three times, it just says literally repeat. Yeah, exactly. So uh, you could just repeat the function um, instead. Um, and it would just run the, the if statements many times, uh, you know. Doing it the way that we've just done, as I've mentioned, it's pretty wasteful. Basically. So sequences themselves, they can be repeated until they're told to stop. And that's what iteration is. Okay. So that is an example. Yep. Simple as that. It would do the whole process again. Probably not ideal because you wouldn't want to boil the kettle three separate times but that technically would work very wasteful okay. if time <laughs> but that's irrelevant that would get us three cups of tea come the end of it fingers mm -hmm. crossed 
So what about this then? What the kettle, bowl the kettle, put the tea bag in the cup, actually in the cup. Bowl. What's this doing? Till okay, so it's just saying repeat until there's no water left in the kettle. How many cups of tea would you have? Uh I don't know. <laughs> Depends on how much water's in the kettle. Exactly. Exactly. This is you interpreting algorithms right now. Okay. What about this one then? Repeat until water and kettle is zero, or cups left equals zero, or tea packs. Okay, so in other words, that's just saying until something runs out that's needed to make the cup of tea. Is it just something that runs out? Are you sure? Or if people are wanting the tea equals zero. So if also, if there's no one wanting a cup of tea, but yeah. then how does it know if people want a cup of tea or not? Well, you don't know. It hasn't even got an input, has it? It's not inputting. You know, people wanting tea equals four. There's no none of that in this this um, bit of algorithm. It's just purely a snippet. So, how can algorithms be documented? Well, you can do it in something called pseudocode, uh, mm -hmm. which takes it takes the idea and makes it a bit more programmery. <laughs> That makes sense it it tries to add quite a few um different parameters and syntax and things like that to make it more um it, it makes it easier to then go ahead and program it if you were given an uh, a piece of pseudocode you should quite easily then be able to convert it into c sharp or javascript or whatever it may be that you need to do mm-hmm Another thing you could technically do is put it into a, a nice looking flow chart. That's kind of documenting an algorithm for sure. Because okay. you've got you, you've got your decision making process here. Here. What construct is this I've just highlighted? Can you remember? That uh, three constructs. Let's see, that'll be a selection. Mm, yep. Spot on. These ones here. You had me going for a sec when you was going, oh, no. <laughs> that would be a sequence. Good, exactly. So let's move on. So pseudocode, it's that bridge between the algorithm and the actual code to be used. It can't be, you can't just chuck it into a machine and paste it as a text file and then you've got your program in Visual Basic. It doesn't work like that. Um, the, there probably will be that sort of feature in the future as AI starts getting a bit more involved, but mm -hmm. not for now. Um, it doesn't really have any formal syntax. Do you know what syntax means? Uh, isn't it like words that make up a sentence that make up a language? It makes up that programming language. Yeah, you must use this in this order or you must use this word to declare a variable. That's the syntax. But a pseudocode doesn't necessarily have to follow a syntax and it's more likely to be close to the specific language the author is comfortable using <laughs> if that makes sense so if they're more familiar programming in uh, microsoft basic uh, then they probably are more likely to use basic type language i mean basic as in a programming language not that it's easy <laughs> okay that's, that's a type of programming language or they could do it in JavaScript because they're more familiar with coding in JavaScript. So their pseudocode would more likely mirror JavaScript language. Does that make sense? So just be aware, it doesn't always follow a standard rule. Okay. You don't have to always declare variables in pseudocode. Um, you can do. It's probably useful, but you don't have to. Um, so this is hopefully trying to take uh, the same example in a bit more pseudo code style. Okay. So okay. this is more mirroring uh, the basic programming language because I've declared a subroutine. That subroutine is called make T and that okay. subroutine clearly ends. Just note that we've got indentation. Yeah. That's quite useful and definitely needed in certain types of programming language. So we've got um, we've got the subroutine there. What's our first variable? First variable is kettle content. 
Yeah. So what's happening to start off with? It's checking. Is it checking? Content. No, hold on. Checking content equals zero. Is this is selection? It... Is this iteration? Or is this sequence? Content equals zero. Um, I would say it's selection. And what is it selecting? Uh, if there's water. Where's the if guessing? statement? No, okay, so count content equals zero, then input number of properties. Also needed makes cover. So what is this then? What construct is this? So it's just a sequence. It is, spot on. Emptying the water out the kettle. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> They're emptying the kettle, literally. So this is actually good pseudocode notation because you're telling the program that you need an input so we've now got another variable and that would depend on whatever the user inputs yeah so five one regardless Number what's this what sort of construct is this one then out of the three construct okay one needed equals number of cups so that would be a selection are you sure okay. Let's see um, take your time chris uh, what needed equals number of cups of tea to make times in Oh no, it's just uh, another sequence again. Absolutely. What do you think that's doing? It's, it's based off the, how many number cups of tea to be made depends on how much water is needed. So I, I'm just ballparking. If it is number of cups to make times 250. Mm -hmm. Then, however much water is needed to make 250. Yeah, it's basically saying, right, water needed is however many cups we need to make times by 250, whatever that number is. So that's another variable. And then we've got kettle content, which is the same variable as up here, mm -hmm. is now the water needed. So, what are they doing here? What's the actual robot having to do? So now it's saying that it needs to put water inside the kettle. Yeah, it's filling it up, measuring out how many milliliters of water is needed and filling it up. You could imagine a washing machine doing this sort of task. You know, if you've selected a quick wash cycle or it weighs the weight of clothes in the washing machine drum and it'll say, right, we've got 14 kilos of washing, so we need mm -hmm. now 14 liters of water. Okay. What's this doing here then? What type of construct is this? It's just saying do uh, keep filling up the water until no, cut content what needed. Do until number of cups make a zero. So stop filling up the kettle once you've once you've done finished the cups. Are you sure? So what coming back to those constructs, those three constructs, what type of construct have we got here? Uh out of the three constructs. Insert two lanes to cup, insert the uh, um oh, is this an iteration? Good. Why is it iteration? Because it has to do it more than once. It's repeating itself. Yep. Potentially. It's, yeah. So if you think here, right, this is the start of the loop. This mm -hmm. is the end of the loop. But just to trick you, we've also got another iteration statement in here as well. Do not until T strength equals T strength required. <laughs> okay. What's that doing? This iteration here. Next. Is that saying do until three things to... Oh no, hold on. Insert sugar in the cup. Maybe. No, just what I've highlighted in the square box. What is this bit doing? It's it, well, it's saying to do it until it meets a certain do tea what? strength. So stir the cup. Exactly. So that's now it's a varied amount of stirring. You could just stir it once. You could just you could be stirring it four hundred times. That's a loop. Right, okay. Does that make sense? That does. 
Now, I've also been a little bit mean because this um, it won't actually work. <laughs> this piece of pseudocode won't actually work at all. Because you've got this loop here. It will insert mm -hmm. tea bag. It will minus the kettle content into the cup. It will stir it for 15 seconds. It will then carry on stirring it if it needs to. Then add the sugar, remove the tea bag, insert the milk, stir the cup for 15 seconds, and then next it will go back to that loop. Mm -hmm. So what this will do is run it infinitely because the number of cups to make won't equal zero because we've not told it to. You would need that. Because when it gets to the end of a loop, he'll then go mm -hmm. number of cups to make minus one. <laughs> right, okay. I see. Yeah. Now, other pseudocode notations, it could just be next uh, number of cups to make. So you could just, you could write that in there instead. So next number of cups to make. And then it would basically do the same thing as number of cups to make minus one. If that makes sense. I'm yeah, just giving you an idea of where, mm -hmm. however, ways, different ways it could be constructed. I just want to stress, so Chris, you don't have to be able to do this yourself. You have to understand and be able to interpret these for this qualification. Okay. All right. Although, I will get you to make some. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no better than trial by fire. Here's another example. Will this work? Game content equals zero. What will you equal in the context? Four to make. So what we've got here is we've got the for loop and it's been labelled to make. And we're saying that it's from zero to two. And then you'll put next to make, so it'll then go zero, one, two, stop. Okay. Does that make sense? So that's mm -hmm. a for loop. You're repeating it a specific number of times because you've told it to. Okay. Yeah? Whereas the other one, the other construct was a do until. That's actually iteration with a criteria associated. Whereas this one is just doing it for a specified number of times. So like in your washing machine example, it will be turning the uh, washing clockwise for 15 seconds, anti-clockwise for 15 seconds, clockwise for 15 seconds, anti-clockwise to 15 seconds, until it moves on to the next instruction, drain the water. Yeah? Okay. So that's when you would use those. Because it's basically nested, so next, nested sequence. It's doing it, repeating it several times. Okay? Okay. Right. So, pseudocode notations. This is a sort of language you'd expect to find. Inputs, outputs, uh, while loops. So you could have while ingredients is greater than zero. It would then do that iteration loop until that condition was not met. Or okay. four is where you've got that specified number of times. So four, three times or whatever. You've got that, repeat until, that's common. Mm -hmm. You'll see it in pseudocode. And then obviously this. Okay. You can have, yeah, that's that, yeah. That's it. That's all I'm going to go through today. So it is purely just the principles and the having the understanding and awareness to be able to interpret that, that code. Because... We've already had mm -hmm. this conversation before. When there are problems in the code, it's going to be you that has to try and fix it. And we don't have to write all of our plugins for WordPress or write where our syntax is going in the HTML to get Google Analytics to load. We don't have to write that code, but we need to at least be able to read it so that if there's a problem, we know where it is. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. That was just an example of a... A problem that Katie had recently where Google Analytics was being called too many times on the WordPress site 
and it was because the calling code, the actual thing that made it function, was being done on every HTML header <laughs> instead of just on the website header. Okay. So you need to be able to read that HTML content to be able to kind of pick to pieces what what functions are being executed and why. Okay. Okay. Oh, just another thing as well. When you've got your um, pseudo code, you can, um, let me go back. You can actually comment on stuff in really plain common. English. So, do you know, like, if you're in a Word document and you can actually comment a selection and yeah. make the author aware of what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. you could put double forward slash and then a comment. Uh, this process is basically pouring the desired milk into the cup. And you can actually program a comment which the machine ignores, mm -hmm. but the human being that's programming it can read it. And is that specifically in pseudocode? Or... You'd, you'd, you'd actually do that in the um, actual code itself, but there's nothing wrong in pseudocode in writing some comments to help the reader understand what's happening in you know plain English. So yeah, yeah. That, that can sometimes sometimes be useful. But if you ever do uh, branch out and do some uh, coding in whatever language, whoever's teaching you how to code. They will insist that every single section they will ask you to comment just to make it clear for the author, for the, anybody right. else. Okay. Okay. That's it. End of session. Oh, nice. I'll let you get on. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye.